All right, let's go together in the Word to Acts chapter 17, shall we? (laughs) Acts chapter 17. And uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy have been travelling around planting churches. They'd been to Thessalonica in Greece and uh, they'd been sorely persecuted there and kicked out. They went on to a town called Berea uh, where they had a much more friendly reception and uh, Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea with the uh, newly formed church and Paul went on to Athens in Greece and uh, we'll pick it up at verse 16 which says that while Paul was waiting for them, talking of Paul and Silas, while he was waiting for Paul and Silas in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? And uh, others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. If I just stop there for a moment and just give you a little bit of insight, the word resurrection uh, in the Greek is anastasis, which was also a, a woman's name. And so Paul is here talking to them about Jesus and Anastasis, and he's, uh, they're, they're thinking he's talking about the names of two gods. And so that's why they're, they're saying here, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection, or Jesus and Anastasis. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. And then in brackets, it says, all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Sounds like Women's Weekly. (laughs) That's what they were doing. And so we're going to read on in just a moment, but I just want to give you a little bit of background as to what was happening here. So Paul leaves Paul and uh, Timothy and Silas. He goes to Athens, which was one of the largest cities of the day. The Roman Empire had made it a free city, even though it was still part of, of the empire. And so they were free to do what they want, worship who they wanted, and so on. And as Paul's walking through the town, he is distressed because everywhere he looks, there are idols. And so he finds his way to the Jewish synagogue, which was normally what he would do. Uh, He found, obviously, God-fearing Jews and uh, and God-fearing Gentiles there, and he preached the gospel to them. But it says he didn't just go to the the, uh, synagogue, he also went to the marketplace as well. And the marketplace in Athens was known as the Agora. It was the heart of the city of ancient Athens. It was the focal point of all political, commercial, administrative, social activity. It was the religious center. It was the cultural center. And it was also the seat of justice. So right in the middle of the city, Paul starts to declare Jesus there. And this crowd gathers around him. And we're told that the crowd is made up of two types of philosopher. There were Epicureans and there were Stoic philosophers. Now, let me just give you a little bit of historical background here. The Epicurean philosophers were founded by a Greek philosopher by by the name of Epicurus. And uh, he attracted mainly wealthy people, educated upper classes, and they believed that life's goal was pleasure. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? I think we're still in the grip of a bit of Epicureanism today. Um, Pleasure was defined as peace, and freedom from fear, and an absence of pain. So there were Epicureans there who believed that, and then there were also Stoic philosophers. They were founded by the Greek philosopher Zeno, and they were diametrically opposite to the Epicureans. The Stoics believed that you had to be self-controlled and resilient, and that you built that into your life by voluntary 
voluntarily abstaining from worldly pleasures. So you can see how different these guys were. Epicureans, we just want to have fun. We want to have pleasure. We don't want any pain, any problems. The Stoics, they're deliberately going without stuff in order to bring self-denial and self-control into their life. Uh, as you read through this, by the way, Paul comes much more on the side of the Stoics than he does on the side of the Epicureans, just out of interest. In fact, his sermon that we're about to hear would have actually divided the crowd. Um, so when he was speaking, then these philosophers took Paul to a place called the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus was the chief court. It was the, the court of justice in Athens. It was about 100 elite members they had authority to evaluate new religions and philosophies that were coming to the city to decide whether or not an official platform would be given in the marketplace or in the agora for this person to be able to proclaim their version of truth. And so the Epicureans and the Stoics say to Paul, right, you come with us. We're going to take you to this, this court of justice. You've got to stand there and present your teaching and, and this group of people who spend all day, um, as, as it says there in verse 21, um, uh, all of the people that were there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. And so they're listening to Paul's idea, which we know is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that historical background in mind, let's go back to uh, reading in Acts 17 here and verse 22. And so he's in the Areopagus. He's standing before these hundred people plus others that were gathered in the area. Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and he said, men of Athens. And I want you to notice as, as we read this, that he actually is very kind to these people. He is not deliberately trying to antagonize them uh, or to be obnoxious to them in any way. He's actually trying to engage with them and take them on a journey. And so he stood up and he said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. In other words, you are spiritual people. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now, what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. I love that. I, I think, church, we still need to look for uh, bridges that we can build with people in our culture, uh, in our everyday lives. So often as Christians and churches, we build walls that, that keep people away from truth. And I love what Paul does here. He, he said, because earlier it tells us that Paul was greatly distressed as he was walking through Athens and he was looking at all of these idols and he was shaking his head. But when he gets to the Areopagus and he's standing in front of these people, he says, I've been walking around your city. He doesn't tell them he was greatly distressed. He says, I've been looking at your objects of worship and I noticed one that has an inscription on it to an unknown God. It's that God I want to tell you about. Very wise. Now, the background there is fascinating. There was a guy in the 6th century, so 600 years before Paul was there. His name was Epimenides. He was a poet, a philosopher, a very intellectual man. And it was at that time, not just in Athens, but throughout the, uh, the nation of Greece, there was a terrible plague uh, that hit the nation. And so the people uh, of Greece decided to sacrifice to every god they knew because they realized, or they believed back in those days, that whenever uh, trouble hit, that one of the gods was upset by something that someone had done, and sacrifice had to be made to get back on the right side of the god, because the god was ticked. You know, we can still bring that philosophy into our lives as Christians. When something goes wrong in our lives, most of us will think, oh, what have I done wrong? <laughs> and and, and you, we might have done something wrong. But, but more often than not, we haven't done anything wrong. Uh, you know, oh, have, I, have I upset God in some way? And we find ourselves saying, God, if you'll get me through this, you know, I'll get up at four o'clock every morning and pray. Um, I'll read twice the amount of my Bible. I'll do this, I'll do that. And what we're doing is just making modern day sacrifices to try and um, please or appease a ticked off God. 
And so that's what they were doing 600 BC. Uh, But after they had sacrificed to every god, the plague continued. And so Epimenides, in his wisdom, said there's probably a god that we don't know about. And if we, um, if we make sacrifices to this God, to the unknown God, maybe that will appease him. And so he suggested getting all of these sheep and sending them out over Mars Hill and over the countryside. And he got people to follow each of the sheep. And uh, whenever a sheep got tired and lay down, they uh, sacrificed the sheep. Though They built an altar first and they sacrificed the sheep And uh, they did that all over the countryside. Wherever a sheep lay down, they would build an altar. And on it, they put the inscription to an unknown God and sacrifice to that unknown God. And after they did that, the plague finished. And so fast forward 600 years back to the time of Paul. And he said to the Areopagus, "Uh, this, this, this fact in history that you're fully aware of when the plague stopped this unknown God, I want to tell you about him now. And these next verses, he tells them about Jesus. In verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us for, and then he then quotes Epimenides, this, this poet from 600 years before, in him we live and move and have our being. So that statement is from a pagan poet 600 years uh, before Paul, but the Holy Spirit, as Luke was writing this down of what uh, Paul had said, says we're going to take those words spoken by a pagan poet and we're going to breathe on them and now they're inspired. In God, we live and move and have our being. And then he quotes another couple of poets um, after that. If you look at the next verse, it says, uh, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And then he goes on in his message, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, like an idol, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. In other words, sometime in the future, Paul was going to be invited back to the Areopagus to present the gospel in more detail. And then it finishes up in verse 33 and verse 34. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus. So he was one of the 100 and also a woman named Damaris and a number of others. So they were convinced by what they heard and they became followers of Jesus Christ. In these verses, Paul affirms that God is everywhere and that we are all his children and that he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. That God's desire is that everyone would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And so that's our theme for 2016, in him. It's about broadening the picture of God's involvement in and through our lives. And in the remainder of our time together, I want to talk about a couple of things that restrict us in seeing that God uh, literally wants to invade every part of our lives. Um, On on, uh, Mars Hill, they sacrificed sheep. Tonight, I'm going to sacrifice a couple of sacred cows. Is that okay? Everyone ready for a barbecue? Because these two sacred cows 
inhibit us living in him. The first of the sacred cows is what I'll call the sacred and the secular. That is that God is only interested in being a part of the spiritual things in our lives. So the spiritual things, we're doing a spiritual thing right now, aren't we? Because we've gathered together as believers in Jesus. And so this is spiritual right now. Uh, When we pray, when we read the Bible, that's spiritual and God is interested in that. But then there's the rest of our lives, which is not spiritual, it's, it's, it's non-spiritual, it's, it's, it's secular, uh, according to this sacred cow. Uh, and God's not present in those things. Things like sport and leisure activities or work, except obviously spiritual work like I do. <laughs> when we buy into that sacred cow, we're actually buying into Greek thought rather than Hebrew thought. This is, the, this is what we buy into this. Even the church in 2015, 2016, we buy into this, this sacred secular thing. These things are sacred. These are about God. But now I have to switch off the sacred switch and switch on the secular switch because now I've got to go to the football or I'm going to catch up with friends or now I've got to go to work. I've had people say to me, one day, Pastor Rob, I, I, I want to stop working and become a pastor. I never know quite how to take that. <laughs> the people say to me, what do you do during the week? And I say, oh, nothing much. You know, I just twiddle my thumbs. And you know, about four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, I walk into my office and there's a message. It's amazing. It's quite good. Sacred and secular. If we take you back to... Um, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, the story of creation. Let me read to you the first things that God said to people. Because think about this. God had just created. He created people and his first instructions to them, you would think would be spiritual, wouldn't you? And they are, but they're not what we would think. He doesn't create people and then say, read your Bible, pray, pray all of this kind of stuff. Look at what he says. The first thing he ever said to a human being is, you are free. I love those words. In other words, freedom of choice is a spiritual act. Choose wisely. The next words he says, you are free to eat. Hallelujah. (laughs) Food is spiritual. You are free to eat. And even more so when you enjoy your food with other people. I I did an 11-part series a few years ago called Let's Party. And uh, if you were not in Bayside at that time, you might want to go onto our website and download that series because it talks about all of the celebratory aspects of of the Scriptures and uh, the, the five major truths in the New Testament were all given uh, by Jesus or the apostles to people when they were eating together. Eating together, it's refreshing. It's encouraging. It's actually a spiritual activity. It's not secular. The next words that uh, God said to people, you are not free to eat from that tree. In other words, boundaries are spiritual. Then he said, be fruitful and increase in number. I think that's the only commandment that people have ever been able to obey all the time. (laughs) Sex is spiritual. Inside a marriage relationship. And so is time you spend with your family. Is a spiritual activity. I've had mum say to me, Rob, I'd I'd love to get in the ministry, but at the moment I've got little kids. And my response to that is, you are in the ministry. You are pastoring your children. Please take that pressure off yourself. It's the same as, you know, when I was a single man, I never had a problem uh, finding time every day to read the Bible. I I just, I had that that, uh, time with the Lord. But when you have kids, everything changes. But I had to get my head around this, you know, because I would sit down uh, to read my Bible and, and then about two, it's like there's a radar in Trinity. Daddy, 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 daddy. That's it, yeah. 
And, and, and as soon as I sit down to read, and then she comes, I want a hug. So what do I do? Go away, I'm being spiritual. <laughs> no. I, want, I put my Bible down, and I keep being spiritual. I hug my child and spend some time with her. And then at a later time, hopefully, I will get back to my Bible study. But we've got to get our heads around this. We don't just switch on and switch off spirituality. Because in him we live and move and have our being. The next thing in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Right there, God blessed work and called it a spiritual activity. Please realize that whatever you do for a living is, is part of the commandment of God over your life. He, he, he didn't design us for constant leisure. In fact, if you've ever been unemployed, I was for a while, if you've ever been unemployed, it's one of the toughest times of your life because it gives no purpose to leisure because there are no boundaries on leisure. But when you've worked hard, you actually get to enjoy your leisure and both aspects are spiritual. Take God to work with you. Amen. And then the last thing he said to them in Genesis chapter 2, it is not good for the man to be alone. In other words, social interaction with others is a spiritual activity. I hope uh, after our gathering tonight that some of you will go out uh, and enjoy time together. Maybe invite people around for a, a, a meal or go out to a cafe or, or just hang out together. And that is church continued. We got to get that into our heads as well. We don't turn on church and turn off church. It's not something you attend, it's something you're a part of. Yeah. Amen. This is the gathering of believers right now and after this we will we will scatter, but let's try and scatter together <laughs> and go and hang out together and enjoy some time together. And it doesn't matter it doesn't mean that we're sitting around uh, you know, with our Bibles and praying all the time. We're just talking, laughing, enjoying each other's company, having fun together. And that is spiritual activity. It's be and we take Jesus with us. Amen? Because he's in us. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. In Psalm 24 and verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. That's the Hebrew perspective, not sacred secular. The earth is the Lord's. Everything in it, the world, all who live in it. So let's barbecue that sacred cow of the sacred and the secular. I can smell it burning right now because in him we live and move. And have our being. The second sacred cow, the God who must be coerced. A God who has to be called down into various situations that he would otherwise stand aloof from. You hear this reflected sometimes in prayer meetings or even in, in church gatherings. Oh God, you know, it's like we got to pull him down from heaven. And he's, he's reluctant. But if we pray hard enough, then, then God will go, oh, right, you're praying. I better come down, hang out with you for a little while. It's all right now. Happy? I'm going back to heaven now. Is it all right with you? Is it? Some sort of divine John Cleese. If we have that view of God, our view is faulty. This came to me in a moment of inspiration. <laughs> Wouldn't it be bizarre if, if we treated people the way that we treat God? Like, you know, you're invited to a barbecue. Can you imagine? Like, so I'm invited to a barbecue. You invite me around to your place and I come to the barbecue and I'm standing there and people keep talking about me like I'm not there. So when's Rob coming? I thought Rob was going to come. Oh, I'm here. Rob. When are you coming to the barbecue? They ring me and I'm standing right next to them and my phone rings and I answer, Rob, please come. I'm here already. 
It would be bizarre. God is already here. Why are we praying for God to be here when he's already here? It doesn't make sense. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, Jesus said, Where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Just out of interest tonight, I know there's more than two or three here, but who have particularly come here tonight to gather together in the name of Jesus? Let me see a show of hands. Good. It's not a trick question. It's okay. <laughs> Some people are like... Isn't it horrible when you raise your hand, you know, and, you, and then you realise you're wrong? So, <laughs> no, no, I was just <clears throat> scratching it. Yeah, so I would say, you know, like the vast majority, if not all of you, have deliberately come here tonight because you want to gather together in the name of Jesus. So if two or three is all that is needed to gather together in the name of Jesus, for Jesus to be there in the midst, then what about if there's two or three hundred? Jesus still there? Okay, that means he's here, right? So if he's here, do we have to pray for him to be here? No. Correct. Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10. The psalmist David, he asks this question, where shall I go from your spirit? Uh, The answer, if you wanted to do an abridged version, is nowhere. He asks a number of questions here to determine if there's anywhere he could go, to get away from the Spirit of God. A little bit like Roadrunner and Coyote. The answer is nowhere. Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol or the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. What he's saying there is the same as Epimenides said in 600 BC. In him we live and move and have our being. Everywhere you go, God is there. He is vitally interested in all we do and wants to be a part of it. He does not need to be coerced or brought down, so let's barbecue that sacred cow as well. Can you say amen? Let me demonstrate uh, something to you. If I can have my, my bag, please. Just bring the whole bag up here. That'd be brilliant. Thank you, Hattie. All right. Let me, let me read a scripture uh, to you. This is from John chapter 14 and verse 20. And Jesus said, I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Just leave that on the, on the screen, if you would, please. I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Do you get the picture? In him we live and move and have our being. Right. No watermelons this week. I brought this. In fact, I had to look all around the house this week to find at least some of it. I love babushka dolls, but they're so full of themselves. Thank you so much. I think. Okay, let's see what what the scripture is saying. I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. So we know that, that Jesus said he is in us by his Holy Spirit, right? So if you are a Christian, you've accepted Jesus, he is your Lord, your Saviour, the Holy Spirit, this is the Holy Spirit, in case you wonder what he looks like, now we know. <laughs> the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, okay? So the Spirit of God is in you, okay? And then Jesus said, you are in me. So this can be Jesus, we and the Holy Spirit go inside Jesus. And then he said, but I am in my Father. Amen. In him, we live and move and have our being. May that change our lives, change our thinking, 
everywhere we go, he goes too. Amen. Wonderful. Let's bow in prayer together. It was during these months the Apostle John was arrested by Domitian and banished to the island of Patmos, where he was forced into hard labour in the mines. While on Patmos, John received the revelation of Jesus Christ, which he wrote down and sent to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Upon his release from the island prison, John moved to Ephesus, where he became the pastor of the Ephesian church until his death at the age of 94 in AD 100. John wrote his first epistle from Ephesus sometime during these years. Most scholars put the date as somewhere between 80 and 85 AD. 